triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to worship Him in spirit and in truth. God welcomes us to make confession before Him and one another that we might receive His mercy and forgiveness. And so, merciful and loving God, your word reminds us that whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces their sins finds mercy. We declare and depend on this promise for us as we confess our sins before you. And God sent his son, the babe of Bethlehem, to show his infinite love and forgiveness for all. Hear again the good news. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, by his coming and sacrifice, your sins are forgiven. God has remembered them no more. Amen. Amen. Now let us pray together. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading is from Isaiah, the 40th chapter, beginning at verse 1, found on page 718 in the Pew Bible. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it, will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithlessness, faithfulness excuse me, is like the flowers in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who make good news for Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news for Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Reading from today's gospel in Mark chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, 
the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Christ, it is a blessing, a gift to be here, truly, to take life and breath this day from you. Thank you for your mercies uh, that are new each and every morning. Thank you for your, the words that are before us, and the words you have for us this day. We ask that you would remove any hindrances, any walls, any blocks that would keep us from hearing from you this morning. May then the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, we began Advent Sunday, and as a recap, I'll remind you what we talked about, but I'm going to use the words of a friend. He and his wife left church last week, and they were kind of talking with each other about the sermon and in a, uh, in a joking way, uh, they wrote to me their recap. The recap was this. Uh, Advent has begun. Merry Christmas. The world's going to end. <laughs> okay, so maybe it was one of those sermons. <laughs> but we're anticipating here in the season of Advent the second coming of Christ. And the reality is, as we read the scriptures, is that things will get worse and are getting worse before they get better, before the coming of Christ is revealed again. But let's look back then, because one of the things we do during Advent is we remember the first coming of Jesus, the baby in the manger, God incarnate. Today's scripture text introduces us to John the Baptizer, or as we know him, John the Baptist. So who is this guy? He is the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah. In the Gospel of Luke, we get a really nice recording of that Gospel writer of who John the Baptist is. And so in Luke 1, in verse 7, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So Elizabeth and Zechariah, who was a priest in the temple, are both of an age that they thought they could not conceive. And yet, here John the Baptist is given to them. John the Baptist is actually kin of Jesus. Luke 1.36, Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. This is the angel Gabriel who comes to Mary and says to her, you will have the Christ child. And then says, your kin, maybe it's a cousin, we're not sure exactly what kind of relationship, but she's going to conceive as well. And she's in her sixth month. So how much older is John the Baptist from Jesus? Anybody? Quick math. <laughs> hmm, six month ish right six months or so so they're about the same age this John the Baptist was also anointed by the Holy Spirit it seems in Luke 1 verse 41 the gospel writer accounts for this when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting so Mary after hearing the announcement of the angel goes to visit Elizabeth and when they come together, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So even before birth, these two are enjoying one another's fellowship and company, it seems. John the Baptist grew up and lived in the wilderness, Luke 1, 80, and the child grew and became strong in the Spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. And then in our Gospel reading this morning, verse 6, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. John was most likely a part of the religious sect called the Essenes. They lived out by um, the uh, Qumran area, uh, and so they most likely just lived this life of sustenance, this life of simplicity. And so John grows up, 
and enters in back into Judea and Jerusalem, but he's preaching out in the desert, and he's preparing the way for Jesus. Mark verse 2, as I read, the prophet Isaiah is quoted, and Mark says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And so it's prophesied that John the Baptist was the messenger that made way for Jesus. And then this messenger baptized for repentance. This is a moral repentance. This isn't necessarily a spiritual. It's a different repentance. It's a different baptism than the baptism of Jesus, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And so Mark, or John came into the scene preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then it didn't go so well for John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist uh, went to Herod, who was uh, in the north in the uh, Galilee region, and uh, told Herod that he was committing a sin by marrying Herodias, his uh, brother's bride. Well, that didn't go so well for him. And as recorded later in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, for John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, so Herodias, the one who's the wife of both now, Herod and his brother, she nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. And as the story get, continues and goes, uh, at this very elaborate banquet, she tricks Herod into giving her John the Baptist's head. So he died a martyr. So this is John the Baptist. That's all well and good. But what is a life if that life doesn't give light and testimony to Christ? I appreciated Pastor Bob's words for us this morning and his admonition, his prayer, his blessing upon us, if you heard it, was that in this season of Advent we would be attuned to how God is calling us to give God light and glory around us, where we live, where we are. You see, that's what the message of John the Baptist is really about. He's giving light and glory to Jesus Christ as he prepares the way, as he gives this message. And what is that message? Well, it's found in verses 7 and 8 in our gospel. And this was his message. You know, sometimes in the gospels, they're very clear. We don't have to go digging. We don't have to find deeper meaning. The words are simple. This was the message of John the Baptist. He says, after me comes the one more powerful than I. What does that mean? After me comes one more powerful than I. Well, after me seems to indicate simply a chronological after. So after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. You see how John the Baptist's ministry was complete when Jesus began his ministry. John would not baptize anymore for the repentance of sins when Jesus came on the scene. In fact, you can hear the, the Baptist's words of humility when he says, God, may I decrease as you increase. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus increased as John the Baptist decreased. He's already in prison as Jesus begins to preach the good news. So when John says, after me, he simply means a chronological following. I came as the messenger, and now the, the Messiah comes himself. But who is the one? John says, the one more powerful than I. Who is this one? There are several options. And so in the first century, the Jews were expecting one to come. But not just one. They were expecting many to come. The one could mean God himself. Yahweh was coming. The one could mean to John the Messiah, the promised anointed one. The one could mean the Son of Man. These are the words we talked about from the, the prophet Daniel. 
the one could mean the end times prophet. There was a prophet to come that spoke at the end times. So in the midst of these many options, how do we narrow it down? What was John the Baptist thinking? Most scholars seem to agree, based on Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, as Jim read for us, which says, make straight in the desert a highway for our, anybody following along? <laughs> God, for our God. It seems that John the Baptist was expecting God himself to come. Are we surprised? We ought not be surprised. Because after all, who was it in that manger? Who was that baby? Jesus. That was God incarnate. That means made flesh. God himself did come in the person of Jesus Christ. Now many today would deny that the one who is Jesus is God. But that only gives them two other options really. As Pastor Corey has quoted C.S. Lewis, we don't have the option of saying he's a great teacher or he was a, a fine moral person. No, if he's not the Savior, if he's not God, if that child in the manger is not the incarnate God made flesh, then Jesus has to be a total lunatic or an outright liar. And so which is it? He's Lord. Not liar, not lunatic, but the Lord himself, God, Yahweh, is in that manger. And so John the Baptist's message becomes, God has come to live among us. As you think about this Advent and your opportunity to bring light and glory to this God who has come, Think about this question. How do I live my life in such a way as though God himself has come? Think about that for a minute. Just, just Let's pause for just a minute and think about this question. As I enter into this Advent season, how do I live as though God himself has come? Does it make a difference to you? That this baby in the manger is not just a cute, cuddly human person, although he was probably that, but he is also the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. John the Baptist's message began with God has come. Number two, John the Baptist's message continued, verse 7, after me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. This is a second part of John's message, and it is simply a message of humility. References in the Old Testament are common when it comes to master and slave. They, they practiced slavery. We can't get away from that reality, and even in the time of Jesus. And so this references the common slave-master relationship. In the Midrash, that's an early rabbinic interpretation of Scripture, the writings of those Jewish leaders or rabbis said that a Hebrew was never required as a slave to untie sandals and wash feet. If you weren't a Hebrew, then you were required to wash feet and untie the sandals of your master. And why would that even be a thing, we think? Well, they wore sandals and they walked in dirt. One and one equals dirty feet. And so when a master came home after traveling many miles or even walking through the city in, in the shops and stores, his feet or her feet would be dirty and so the slave would bend down, untie the sandals, take off the sandals and wash the feet. 
But if you are Hebrew, as John the Baptist is a Hebrew, one of Israel, you were never required to do that. That was, that was considered too low even for a Hebrew slave. But what does John say? John says, as a Hebrew, that the one who is coming is more worthy of me, and, and I am not even worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. That's quite a humble statement from John the Baptist, isn't it? And so I think the, the message after God has come is simply this, that we are to humble ourselves before the God who has come. This is what John the Baptist is getting at. Humble yourselves. I was thinking this week about a story that might illustrate this kind of humility. And I kept going on in my head, well, you know, I was like, is there a good story that would... Uh, it, you know, talk about the humility of someone, you know, bending down and untying sandals and washing feet. Gosh, if there was only a story that, that really could get the point across and illustrate the, the humility one would have by bending down, untying sandals, and washing feet. I wonder where that story would be. Anybody? Hmm. Then it dawned on me, wait a minute, somebody did this. Who was that? The same child who was born in the manger. Jesus bent down at the Last Supper to wash the feet of the disciples. And this is, by the way, why Peter said, Lord, you will never wash my feet. It was so below the station of Jesus, Peter couldn't understand that Jesus would even consider doing this. And yet, Jesus humbled himself the rabbi, the teacher before the student, and washed the feet of those he loved. John's message began with these simple words. God has come. They continued by saying, because God has come, humble yourself. So think for a moment, how do I humble myself before God made flesh? What does that look like this Advent season? For you how do you live this life of humility so so far we're considering two questions how do I live as though God himself has come the second is how do I humble myself before God made flesh and by the way you don't have to memorize these there's a blue sheet that you might be following along on this, you might stick that in your Bible or in your purse or in your pocket and take it with you this week and consider these through prayer and then lastly, what was the message of John the Baptist? The first was, God has come. Second, I believe, John is saying, humble yourselves before this God has come. And lastly, verse 8, John says, I baptize you with water. Now remember, this is all part of John's message. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This has very significant meaning for the Jew in the first century. In Joel, the prophet, and it's also recorded in Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel. I just happen to use Joel because I like this particular passage. In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, the prophet says, using the words of God, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. What days do you think Joel is talking about? Anyone? How about the end of days? The eschaton, end times, the time of the Messiah. And so when the spirit comes we know that it is the time of the Messiah. You see, John is saying to his Jewish counterparts, to Israel, this is the day. A new day has dawned. It wouldn't take long for Jesus to loose his Holy Spirit on the church. 
as recorded in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. In fact, as Jim read for us this morning in 2 Peter, Peter encourages a right relationship with God because this new day has come. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him, with him, with God, with Christ our Lord. And so, in conclusion then this morning, as we remember the first coming of Jesus and the message of John the Baptist, we take that message and make it our own. We begin to proclaim that God has come. We begin to humble ourselves before the Messiah. And we recognize that we live in a most beautiful time. The end times. Because this new day is dawned. And so consider these questions. How do I live as though God himself has come? How do I humble myself before God made flesh? And lastly, how do I grow to be spotless, blameless, and at peace with God? This is the work of Advent. Amen. Father, we thank you again for the gift of your Son, the promise that he will return for us and for the certainty that we will know the inexplicable joy of eternal life with you. Amen and amen. We entrust our prayers to you, Lord Christ, for the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. As Jesus taught, this then is how you should pray. With one heart and voice we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.